Green shade. And go. Okay, so we're gonna be talking. Can y'all see that ethics and professionalism? Yes, sir. All right, awesome, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about different laws and ethics today. So when you talk about ethics and laws, you've got there they are a little bit different. So in the medical world, a law, a medical law is an establishment of social rules for conduct. So think of a medical law as the same as any other law. They establish, they're there for, you know, for criminal, criminal types of behavior and things like that to prevent criminal um, negligence of people, to prevent crime, things like that. Well, medical ethics are a system of moral principles that govern more medical conduct. So they're 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 more, they're not really laws, and they're not anything that you're going to get fired over. But think of these as a as a there as a set of moral principles that the medical that all healthcare workers go by, and we're going to go over those in a minute. Now, when you think of moral, when you think of morals, just in your everyday life, you think of okay, well, if you have good morals, you're you're you try not to lie, you try to be honest, you try to treat people with respect, you try to be try to treat people good, try to treat people kind. And that's what good morals usually are. And that's kind of the same as medical ethics. It's basically the same, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, so professional standards of conduct is a combination of following medical law and medical ethics. So whenever we are treating a patient, we have to comply with the laws and regulations that are in our state that are in our state and in our practice act so we have to represent ourselves you will have to i have to represent myself as a pt you represent yourself as a pta and then you i do thing i can't do anything that is outside my scope of practice that's a law and you can't do anything that's outside your scope of practice that's a law and then when it comes to ethics, um, that is actually um, being professional and representing yourself with good, um, a good attitude, a good attitude toward your patient with good um, communication with your patient, those types of things. Okay, so let's go through some of the biomedical ethical principles that that and this is not just for the PT and PTA world this is for pretty much all of healthcare but these are going to be specific for I'm getting messages from the teachers oh that's later um these are going to be really specific for our world but these are shared by a lot of other um medical professionals too so beneficence is first beneficence is doing the best for the patient so you always want to do your absolute best for your patient and you want to do the best job that you can and that's what and hopefully you're like that in your and that's not just with your patient but hopefully that's what you're like in life too. Everything you set out to do, you want to try to do the best job that you can. You don't want to try to half-ass something. You want to try to do a good job, do the best of your ability, and um, not only for yourself to make yourself proud, but if there's anybody else involved, then in this case, it's going to be a patient that they will know that they're getting the best out of you too. So the example of this is showing genuine concern for physical and psychological well-being of the patient. You show genuine compassion, for, genuine compassion for that person. Okay, the opposite is going to be non-maleficence. We don't want to do. The practitioner shall do shall not do anything that's going to cause harm to the patient. We never want to cause harm. So you don't want to, and we don't mean physically harm, and we do mean physically harm them. Like we don't want to do any exercise that's going to physically overdo it with them and cause them injury or do any modalities with them that we know that's going to harm them. But we don't need to exploit them either by 
exploiting them financially by like, say that you're working in a clinic after graduation and there's a certain equipment vendor that sells walkers and wheelchairs that's done an in-service for your clinic. And y'all are getting to be really good buddies. So he gives you a little deal and says, if you, for every um, referral, if you, if you refer your patients to me to get their medical equipment, like their assistive devices, I'll give you a percentage of every one, a percentage of every patient you refer to me. Well, then if you not do, if you are harming the patient, you're going to start recommending assistive devices to all your patients so that you'll get a kickback from this vendor. So you're exploiting your patients financially by giving them something that they don't really need. Or if in the opposite case, or in another case, if you're, a, if you, there's some therapists out there that after they practice for a while, they do become equipment vendors and equipment specialists. Um, and they go around and they represent the companies and they, they do the fittings for wheelchairs and standing frames and stuff like that. Well, if they are the dealers and they're selling things way at an inflated price, way more than the, what the MSRP is, well then, and they're charging insurance a crazy amount of money for these this equipment, then they're harming the patient financially. And actually, this was before my time, but I heard that like maybe like 20 or 15 or 20 years ago in Houston, there was a big um, problem with D DME, durable medical equipment providers and prosthetic prosthetists people that make artificial limbs, billing people for all these um, crazy pieces of equipment and artificial limbs that they had no need, that they had no, that they didn't need. And people, they were even, they were even um, writing scripts for artificial limbs for people that didn't even have amputations. And they were getting reimbursed for all this stuff until Medicare finally got smart and figured it all out and then those people finally did have to they did get in trouble thankfully but that's a, a kind of thing you don't want to do mr allen yes didn't they change it to where only certain vendors can sell certain dme yep and after that, that they did is that, that why okay yep. i gotcha after i after wondered that how they happened, did that it wasn't just in houston but it was a big scandal in houston that and it was a big thing that hit the news and i, I don't think i lived in houston when that happened because i don't remember it being in the news but um i remember hearing about it when i first moved here and started practicing but they changed a lot of rules especially medicare for getting equipment after that so you have to be real you have to really really need it and have to have a lot of documentation to get it yeah well, and it sucks too because now there's no competition, so they can charge whatever they want. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The next one's going to be justice. The healthcare provider distributes fair and equal treatment. So you're going to advocate for the the need to provide healthcare services to all individuals. So you're just you're you're going to be fair and equal to everybody. You're not going to be you're, I mean, you're not going to treat one community or group of people different than another group of individuals. Um, any, uh, like a group, like you're not going to treat one group of, say, you're not going to treat one, like if you work in a certain community and you work with a lot of people from a certain race or ethnicity, you're not going to treat them different than another group or a certain religious group. You're not going to treat them different in your clinic than you treat people that are not of that group. And people that maybe have certain beliefs or lifestyles that you don't, maybe you don't necessarily agree with it, but you have to treat them exactly like you would want to be treated. You have to, you have to look through all of that stuff and treat them just like you would want to be treated. So don't treat anybody any differently than anybody else. And I think I don't have to tell you that, but that is a biomedical principle that believed or not, we have to put it in writing other, because if we don't, people are going to treat people very, very differently. So I don't think I have to tell any of you that because y'all are mature adults, but you know, there's people out there, we got to put it in writing for them. Okay, here's a weird word, veracity. 
binds the healthcare provider and the patient in a relationship to tell the truth. So this just means an example would be that you would, you know, like you identify yourself as a PTA and not a PT. And the patient needs to be truthful about their history and their symptoms with you. Um, and also you need to be true. If they ask you things like about their prognosis, like after um, meeting them for a few times and getting to know them and working with them and you're working with them on their impairments and their goals. If they come, if they just suddenly say if they're a wheelchair user and you're working on gait training with them and they can walk for say with maximal assist of you and braces, they can walk for 10 feet in the parallel bars, which is, and they have to, and it takes them a long time and it's a lot of work, but they can do it. And then after they win that one day, they just flat up ask you one day, you think I'll ever walk by myself again? Well, you've got to be truthful to them, but you can't be, you can't lie to them either. So, you know, we all, and, but we always know that there's no guarantees, but we always know that there's no we always know in medicine, we've all heard of things that just happen that aren't supposed to happen. And in our world too, there's people that are never supposed to walk again, that walk out the clinic door of the hospital. I've seen people that have, when I was on the brain injury team, I, I've saw so many people come in and half of their brain was just destroyed. They were never supposed to function again. And they walked out the door after two or three months or six months, but they walked out the door. So that was like a walking miracle. So we have to be truthful with our patients. So a patient like the example I just gave you that walked in the parallel bars for 10 feet, you know, we have to be truthful with them and say, you know, you're, what, you've come a long way already by being able to walk in the bars for 10 feet. So we're going to keep doing this, but you do have to, you know, we do have to give them, that would be a time when we would remind them, you know, this is the type of injury you had. And this is how long it's taken to get to this point. So it's going to be a long road when, if anything happens. But you always have to never always, always give your patient hope. Never take away your patient's hope when you tell them the truth. Always let them know that anything can happen. There's always things that happen, happens to people that are unexplained in the medical field. But you need to be truthful to them confidentiality. So y'all know about this too. You'll probably learn a little bit this, about this already. Um, we need, we're, we, everything that goes on between us and the patient is completely confidential. So anything that the patient tells us is confidential between us and the patient. Now, anything the patient tells you is going to, you can tell is confidential between you, the patient and your supervising PT. Now we're going to document we can document things, but our documentation is also confidential. So whatever a patient tells you that goes in the, that goes in documentation can only be seen by the people that um, have the right to look at the medical record. So that's why, how it would be confidential. Um, so this says requires a healthcare provider to maintain privacy by not sharing or divulging to a third party prop privileged or entrusted patient information. Now, you can't, we can share that information about patients if you sign a form telling us that we, you, we can share that information. So if I needed to share some information to you about, with you, to you, well, uh, let me start over. Sorry, my, I'm stuttering. If I needed to share some information about you to an orthotist to get you a brace, I would have to get your permission to sign over some of your medical information to be able to share with the, the orthodontist so they can make the appropriate brace for you. If you don't let me do that, then I'm not gonna be able to get the right type of equipment. Now, most of the time, whenever you go to a new doctor, a new specialist, a therapist, or any kind of provider, that's in that's medically related, you sign a confidentiality and HIPAA form. HIPAA, which we'll learn later, um, either today or Wednesday, is the confidentiality that's a federal agreement. 
um, that a form that you sign. Well, then you also sign a release of medical information form almost every time. You don't have to sign that form. You, you have the right to, to deny that or to not do that. But that gives us the right as healthcare providers to release a patient's information to other healthcare providers, to third party people, to insurance companies, to um, wheelchair vendors, to brace makers, to prosthetic makers. Because if you don't give us the, inf the, the ability to do that, we'll never be able to give you them any of your information and they won't be able to help us get the right product for you we won't be able to get the right services for you. So things like that. So there's sometimes you have to sign over some of your information. Mr. Allen? But, yes. Um, as far as confidentiality, so if like the patient is saying something about like suicidal thoughts or tendencies or things like that, is that something that we would like refer out like, cause that's considered inside the healthcare or how do we handle that situation? Now that is, now that is, I'm glad that's a very good question. Now that is something the patient tells you, but that's the point. If the patient, that's the time, anytime a patient is just, it goes back to like any, just like it goes back to the basics of like the mental health care world. If a patient tells you or is doing something that's they're going to be harmful to themselves, or others, then that's the time when whatever they tell you, yes, you need to report that to somebody. So if they're telling you they're gonna harm themselves or they're having suicidal thoughts or they're getting really depressed and having thoughts of harming themselves or others, well, that's, a, that's something you need to go out and tell somebody about. At that point, you don't need to be, don't keep that confidential because that person is in danger at that point. Yeah, good question. Okay, another one, autonomy, a form of personal liberty or self-governance. So even though we're the, ther we're the therapists and we know the plan of care and we know how to get this, patient's, this patient better, the, the patient has to have complete control over everything. So the right of the patient to have control over his or her own life. So every patient has the right to choose their own provider. So if you go to a doctor and they say, okay, I want you to see um, this, this specialist, or I want you to go see this therapist over here, they might give you, they might be sending you to a specific person that they like or that they trust, and that's their opinion, but you as a patient have the right to go wherever you want to go. So if a, if a doctor writes a script and they know me very well and they, they write a script for their Parkinson's patient and they say, you know, I want you to go see Joseph Allen. He's a, he's a Parkinson's therapist and he's, um, he's, he can help you out. Uh, and they write the script for them to go see me. Well, they can, even though the doctor was specific that they wanted him to go see me, that patient has the right to choose any physical therapist they want to because they have the right to choose their specialist. So the patient has the right to choose their own provider and provider is therapist, doctor. If, if the therapist or doctor tells them they want to use a certain DME company for medical equipment, they have the right to choose their own equipment company. If they want to go with somebody different, it's always their decision. Um, if they, they have the right to choose their own therapist, if you are working with them and say your personalities just clash or they just, there's something about you that just gets under their skin and they can't stand you, they have the right to request to see another therapist or if they just don't like you for some reason. And I hate to say it, sometimes we just don't get along with everybody in the world. They have the right to choose, ask if they can have another therapist, and we have to comply with that. Um, if a patient refuses treatment, we have to give them that right. So, um, you know, if we want to do a certain type of exercise or a certain modality with the patient and it's justified and it's in the plan of care and we know that it's, we're doing something that's going to be, be beneficial for them, if they don't want to do it, we can't make them do it. We document that they refused it, that they didn't want to do it, um, but we can't make them do anything. Um, 
you know, if a patient doesn't want to take a certain medication, a doctor can't make them do it. I mean, it's the patient's life. They can do whatever they want to do. Um, so, and in this, and it's the same way in our practice. And in our practice, if anything we want the patient to do, if they don't want to do it, we can't make them do it. We can only give our patients recommendations and give them education and tell them, and we can try, if they want, if they don't want to do something, we can always try to get them to do it and try to explain how it's going to be beneficial. But in the end, if they don't want to do it, then, you know, it's, it's their right. So it's whatever they want to do. Um, so we'll, this is a little bit more about HIPAA and confidentiality. So the, there will be a HIPAA, an open book HIPAA quiz next Monday. I was mistaken when I said it was going to be today. So it's online already, but it's not going to be until next Monday. Um, we'll watch a video over it, and then you'll have an open book quiz over it. Um, we'll talk about HIPAA now. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. And it was a rule that was passed, and it came from Congress. And... Um, it covers all this stuff. So it's a privacy rule. Somebody got kicked out. Um, it covers protected health information, which is like your all of your medical information. Um, notices of privacy that we have to give for to patients. And then if we are going to disclose their privacy information, like to other specialists or other people, we have to that's what's under this rule too. So we'll talk about all this right now. So HIPAA was established um, in 1996 and it's meant to protect um, individuals' medical records and their personal health information or that's also known as PHI, personal health information. Um, it's just it basically all this means it's it, that everybody under Everybody having to do with anything with the patient, any healthcare provider, any nurse, any therapist, any doctor, anybody that has to do with anything with the patient has to keep all everything confidential. That's all really this is saying. Um, protected health information, PHI, is anything that is any information that can individually identify a person. So like their name, any of their demographics, anything about their um, about their condition, anything that could identify them, and also, and that can be in any form, if it's written, electronic, or oral information. So, um, written information, handwritten information is protected information. Electronically documented things or email things are considered are still considered protected health information. And if you, and even oral information, so say you are working and you're in an elevator and you're working, you're saying you're with it, you're standing there with your OT counterpart and y'all share a patient and y'all are talking about your patient in the elevator. Well, what if you didn't know it, but that patient's grown adult son is in the elevator with you and you've never met him before and he hears you talking about his he hears the two of you talking about his father in the elevator. Well, he knows you're talking about his father, even if you're not using any names, but, or maybe you do use a name and he just, and he hears you say that. Well, he can complain about that and you will get in trouble for that. Um, notice of privacy practices for PHI. Um, the patient, going back to the patient, always has autonomy. The patient always has the right of how we can disclose, keep their personal health information and if we can disclose it or not. So if, if the, they know that we're going to be keeping some other health information because in order to see them and treat them, we have to have in their medical information from their doctor a little bit about their diagnosis at least, but if they don't want us to, if they don't have to, if they don't want us as, as therapists to share their information with anybody else, then they don't have to sign, they don't, we can't force them to do that. So um, 
you know, we do have to give their information back to their referring physician because we have to do that in the state of Texas. We don't have direct access, but um, anything else, if like, if they don't want us to share their information to an orthotist to get a brace or to a wheelchair vendor, if they want to take all of that upon themselves, their own responsibility, I mean, we can try to talk them out of that, but that's their right if they don't want to use what we would recommend. So, what if a patient requests their own stuff from us personally? They can do that because that's their that's their right to do that. They they can do that. Now, a patient can do that. But if a family member or another person does that, you they cannot get that unless they've got written permission from the patient to do that. Does that make sense? Yes. The patient can ask for their information, but not another person. But we don't have to go through like some kind of entity to have it officially printed. We could just print it out and bring it to them like print it out from home and bring it to No, home. you would you would still have to go through an official they would still have to go through the medical records process even to get their own medical records like we couldn't just print out this stuff our notes and give to them they would have to go through like we would have to have an official policy and procedure in place in the clinic or if you work in a big hospital or facility they would need to go to medical records even if they're getting their own medical records yeah but if you're working in a small clinic, you would just you would have to have a policy and procedure in place of how patients could get their medical records from you. You can't just print it and give it to them on a whim. Um, so more things about HIPAA, um, students and tr this says trainees. So this is students and interns like you're going to be. You're permitted to have access to charts and to um, private health information because that's part of your, in order to give care to these patients, you've got to know their health information. So your students and interns are permitted to have information. Um, and so when you all go out on clinicals, you'll be trainees or interns or students still, but you'll have access to each of your patient's medical records. Now you can't look at the medical records of other patients that are in the clinic because that you're not seeing because you don't have anything to do with them. You can only look at the medical records that you have that are your patients. And that goes with for any clinician, even physicians, they are only supposed to look at the charts and the medical records of the patients that they are dealing with. They just can't, if they just, if I'm a, if I'm, if I see a really cool patient in a gym and they've got a really weird diagnosis and I've seen one of you work with them. I'm like, I've never seen a patient like that before. I'm going to go look at their chart because I want to see what their diagnosis is and what they're, what they have, because I don't, it, it looks like something interesting. And then if I go look at their chart and I start reading it, if I get caught doing that, I'm in big trouble because even though I'm a therapist there in that facility, I don't have anything to do with your patient. So I'm breaking the HIPAA rules. Same goes for you if you do it. Um, family members, the privacy rule on family members. Um, so family members and spouses do not have automatic um, access to patient records. So even spouses don't have automatic permission to, make, to records or to make, a, to make decisions. Um, so the patient has to give written permission for anybody in their family, including their spouse, to see their medical records. So, um, so that they, that's in place because say that you're, that there's been many situations in the past where somebody's in the hospital and they say they're in a coma or they're like terminally ill and they're not, they're not able to make decisions about um, say life support or something like or something really important like that and then their family say their their spouse and their adult kids start fighting over all that will say one of they some of them want to keep them on life support the others want to let him go so he can go in peace while the others want to wait it out and then they start fighting over well they start fighting over who's going to make this decision blah 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 well you've got to you know that's why this decision is in place so that it gives the patient the opportunity to make the decision. So there's a, um, we, if a patient is 
going to, if we think a patient is going to become terminal or something like that, we always try to get them to get a medical power of attorney signed so that they can designate a person. And they usually designate like their spouse or their next of kin or like their oldest adult child to be the power of attorney so that if they can't make decisions about their medical care, that next person in line is automatically the, the decision maker. And then that person has the legal right to say, okay, we're going to keep him on life support, or we're going to take him off life support, or we're going to continue treatment, or we're going to stop treatment and go to hospice or something like that. That's just if the patient can't make the opportunity or they don't have the opportunity to make that for themselves. But they always want to give the patient, they always want to wait as long as they can to give the patient the opportunity to make as many decisions for themselves as they can. Can that also be applied to, let's say, I guess, like an emergency, I guess, like a surgery procedure that has to be done. Like, let's say someone, someone gets shot, I guess, in the head or whatever, and they have to go through surgery. Does it just fall, like, fall into the decision of the spouse or something like that? Well, in a situation, you know, in situation, you know, there's not a, I, you know, it was that memo that was asking mm -hmm. that. There was, there's not, I can't give you a, a, a black and white answer to that because that's really a great area because like if there's, I can think like I have a, a really good friend that's a, a PT and in college, his brother was in a motor vehicle accident and um, had a really severe brain injury and was basically on life support and in the ER and I think he was 19 at the time so he was technically an adult but his next of kin was just my friend his brother and his mother his, and they I mean they didn't have legal power of attorney because you know as a 19 year old who thinks I'm going to go sign. I need to get a legal power of attorney signed just in case something happens to me. I mean, no 19 year old is thinking that. So in that case, I mean, there was nobody but the mother to make the decision. And so in that case, they did let the mother make the decision. But the mother and my friend who was in college at the time, they talked and made the decision out themselves that they wanted to take him off life support after they had all the options presented to them, but there was no other family and there was nothing legally in writing. So in that instance, they did let them make the decision. So sometimes there does have to be something in place legally, but if there's nothing in place legally and there's nobody else and they know that person's never going to wake up again because of how bad they're, they are, they just, Sometimes they let somebody make their decision. I can't, so that's why it's kind of a legal gray area. I'm glad I don't have to be in that situation right now. But does that answer your question? I can't give you a black and white answer. So yeah, it's no, of, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's kind like of it's a gray like area. Yeah, I mean it's a really good idea. You always want to have a medical power of attorney. Um, signed, you know, a lot, most people think that if they're married, their spouse is automatically going to be able to make the decision, but that's not the case. So that always, you really, people need to get that done. That needs to be more widely known, I think. Um, Got it. So patient, next, next on the list, patient client authorization for uses and disclosures of PHI. Um, so if we, um, in order for us to share, you know, I said that in order for us to share the patient's information that we had to get their permission. Well, there's also, there are some time, there are some exceptions to the rule when we don't have to get their permission. So if the patient wants their own information, that PHI, their health information, yes, we can give that to them because it's there so we can give it to them. Disclosures to this is Department of Health and Human Services. That's going to be like the like public health, the health department. They're going to be tracking, um, or like the CDC. They're going to be tracking diseases and and things like that. Statistics where we can give information to them. Um, anything that is um, has to do with their like di diagnosis statistics. 
Um, they're, if they have a communicable disease, like say for COVID right now, anybody that, has, that comes in with COVID, if they test positive, they're automatically put in the COVID database that they're positive and they track them. So even though they're a private citizen, they automatically are tracked as having COVID now. And, you know, we used to not do that, but now that, that's, that, that we have a pandemic, we've got to track where these people are. And, and so we, cannot, we can keep people safe and keep it from spreading. If, a, if there's a product recall, say if a, there is a physician's group, an orthopedic group, and they, they do hip replacements and knee replacements, and they've been doing, using the same hardware of knee replacements, say for five years. They've been using the same types of knee, knee replacements. And then the company comes out with a recall on some of those knees. Well, they have to give their company all of the patients that, that, that have those exact types of knees so that they can be, con so that company can contact them and let them know, hey, there's been a recall on your artificial knee. There might be something wrong with it. You might have to get a new one. Um, anytime there's any, any kind of anything to do with domestic abuse, um, elder abuse, anything to do with um, a crime or judicial hearings, anything to do with court orders or um, anything to do with law enforcement, um, we have to comply and give records over to. Um, health oversight activities, if a health agency like um, somebody that does accreditation for your facility or the state health department comes and wants to look at some of your documentation because they want to audit you. They want to audit your charts. Like Medicare comes through and audits charts of people every so often. Then you have to let them do that. And nobody in the patient doesn't have to sign anything over because Medicare is a federal agency. Um, if there's an emergency situation, and say, say you're in, say you're in the hospital, and for some, for a different reason, say you're in the hospital for, you were in, you were in a car wreck, and you have some broken bones, and blah blah blah, and then say you have all of a sudden you go into cardiac arrest and you start coding, and the they call the code, and the the team comes, and they're doing everything to try to bring you back and save your life. Well, in that moment. If the family's in the room, they're screaming out, tell us, what's he allergic to? What's this? Blah, blah, blah. What was he doing? What's this? What, blah, blah, blah. What's his other health suit? Because in that moment, those people don't have time. Those, that's a special code team that are trying to save your life. That's like a code team is like going to be like 20 people at least, if not more. They're going to rush. They're going to come in like a second and be, rush into a room and it'll be full of people. They're not gonna have time to look through the patient's chart to learn everything about the patient's chart. So if you're in there with the patient and the patient get codes and you call the code, then forget about confidentiality. You're just gonna, when, when they come in there and they start asking questions, you're sharing everything you know about the patient so they can save that person's life because they need to know the stuff. And also um, insurance and workers' compensation, we have to uh, share information with them too um, for reimbursement sake um, so they can get, so we can get reimbursed for therapy. And also workers' compensation is on here specifically because most of the time when, if you get hurt on the job, your whole medical, like, all your medical visits and all your therapy and stuff is covered by workers' compensation. Well, you have a, a workers' compensation rep that usually goes with you to every session, like, and holds your hand like a little baby through every session because they want to make sure you're not faking and they want to get you back on the job as soon as possible. So they're going to want every note from us and we have to share it with them. Um, Examples of informed consent just allows patient autonomy. I've said all this. Um, cultural competence. This is a different topic. Um, it's always an evolving process for all of us. I mean, not just as a society, 
but as a for, per, for each of us as a person too. So we need to understand um, different, and this is something that I think in you know as the and as the world is always becoming more culturally competent as the world is becoming smaller. You know, the internet brought just information at everybody's fingertips and so we can learn it about different cultures so fast we can travel anywhere around the world in less than a day on an airplane we can get to any country whenever we want to we can buy a ticket to go anywhere so we're our cultures are all mixing up and we're learning about different cultures and stuff so we have to learn to be competent about different cultures and we have to know about how to respect different cultures so that doesn't mean you have to be, we expect you to be culturally competent in every different culture of the world and every different religion and stuff like that. But this just means that, you know, in your career, you're going to come across people from different countries, of different religions, of different backgrounds from you. Maybe you, they have a complete, maybe everything's, maybe you have a lot of similarities but they have a completely different lifestyle from you, something nothing you would ever understand, or they don't understand the way you are, and they think you're weird. Well, we have to learn to understand each other, work together, because just because we have differences in healthcare, we have to learn to work with each other despite what might be different about us. Now, let me see what's coming up next. Okay, we'll move on so we can finish this up. Um, this is the last part of, we'll go through these real quick. There's a slide on each of these. These are the core values of the APTA. And we'll talk about briefly, that, and there's a slide on each of these. I'm not gonna read through the whole slide because it's a lot of information, but they may, but I'll give you the dirt, the down and dirty and, um, definition, but most of them explain themselves accountability so be account of be accountable for your actions you know um respond to your patient's needs um respond and see res get you know you need to be accountable to your supervising pt um accountable to the laws and ethical codes that we follow from the apta and in healthcare and just be just to be accountable to your patient to do the best job for them and to always tell them the truth and just to be responsible if you make a mistake you know admit to it um, finish your work on time if you don't finish it as soon as you can those types of things just doing the minimal you need to do altruism the primary regard for or devotion to the interest of the patient placing the patient's needs ahead of your self-interest so always placing the patient's needs above your own so just an example if you say you are it's a friday afternoon and you get off or you usually get off early say you get off usually at two o'clock on fridays which a lot of clinics get off early on Fridays and then five minutes before you're supposed to get off your boss comes to you and says oh I'm so sorry so and so a patient just came in and they missed their their they they've been missing their their service or their sessions this week their doctor really wants them to make up this session it, it, right now can you stay one extra hour and make up that session well we're if we place the patient needs above our own self-interest we would we need to stay and do that now yeah that sucks you're ready to leave early on a friday afternoon but yeah that patient is there to be seen so somebody's got to stay and see the patient maybe now if you've got somewhere you've got to go or another you know obligation maybe you can all talk amongst yourselves with other therapists who's going to see this extra late patient but somebody's got to see the patient Another example that says providing providing pro bono services. Pro bono means providing physical therapy services for no charge or for free. So that means things like you could, as a PTA, you could go and do, say, you could go on your own and do a talk to a senior living group on fall prevention. And you could just say, 
maybe they get together for a dinner and then you could give them a 30 minute presentation on how to um, prevent falls in their houses and how to make their houses more fall friendly and, and fall prevention in their homes or how to stay more healthy and strong as they age and things like that. Or whenever the Houston Marathon happens every year, they're always asking the PT and PTA schools for students to come by and help do stretching of the runners before and after the run. And then to hand out water and stuff and things like that during and after the run. So those types of things are pro bono services we can do. And we don't have to have a doctor's order to do that. Those are things we can do on our own. Compassion and caring. The desire to identify with or sense something of another's experience, concern, empathy, and consideration for the needs and values of others. So just understanding the patient and putting, trying to put yourself in the person's shoes, um, trying to put aside any, um, you know, any, if there's any bias, if you have any bias against their culture, their gender, their, their sexual identity, their gender identity, their own lifestyle, anything like that. If you have any of your own personal biases against that, you know, that's your own beliefs, but you cannot put those biases against the pers another patient. If they are willing to work with you, you have to work with them. Um, you cannot treat other people differently just because of the way you feel. Now, an exception with that to that would be if you are of a certain faith or background, say, and you're a female and you're only allowed to work with other females at say, and say, because, you know, because say, if you need to keep your head, if like, if some females need to keep their head wrapped and they can only show certain body parts to females, well, then they need a female therapist. And we come up, we have that happen with us in some of our clinicals. We have one of our CIOPS clinical instructors who, um, she only, um, she sees only the females um, because she can only see the female patients too, but that works out for their clinic. So um, she sees all the females and the females lead her. And in their community, they have a lot of um, Muslim people they, and the women can only work with other females. So she's, has, she has a very well-known, she's very well-known in their community. So there's a PT that gets a lot of business in their community because she can see those that can only see females. But other than that particular example, you know, if, if, if the bias is in our shoes as the therapist, against something of the patient, we can't, we can't hold that bias against them. Now, Mr. The patient, Allen. Yes. I think I read, it was like after the Boston Marathon bombings that um, I guess some of the people that were involved ended up in the hospital and there were a lot of people that were refusing to care for them. Same as like, like family shootings, if it was yeah. you know, in certain hospitals, I guess that would fall under this. Do you still have a right to refuse to treat a patient if they've done something that honestly you, if if a patient has even if it's a patient that has done something like committed a crime and you know it and that they're in you're seeing them because of that you have to see them yeah you have to see them so i mean if there's physical therapy physical therapists that work in prisons and they provide therapy needs to the prisoners and all of those, everybody in there has, or most everybody in there is guilty of a crime. And even the people that are felons are on death row that have chronic orthopedic injuries, they treat those people. And whether they know about their particular crimes or not, I mean, they go into the cells or into the, with the guards and provide therapy. So yeah, if you're in a hospital and something like that has happened, you, you can't really refuse it. Now, I can't say that if I was in that situation, it was a mass shooting and it was a shooter. It wasn't, it was the, the person that did it that was in the hospital. And I was out, say they just shot up a school and they told me to go in and do something. I can't say that I wouldn't, I don't know what I would, I probably would refuse even though I'm not supposed to. So that, if that, that answers your question, we're not supposed to, but if it was something really bad, I think I would probably put myself in 
Like Wyoming. specifically, if you thought that something that they had done, I guess, would prevent you from giving them the best of what you have to offer. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a gray area. We're not really supposed to re refuse to treat somebody, but I don't know. If they just murdered a whole flock of people or if they just murdered a cop, I mean, in cold blood, I mean, I'm not going to be treating them the same as a little bitty old lady that just had a stroke. I mean, I can't, right. I can't treat that person with the same respect, but that's just me. Can anyway. that affect you in the future? Huh? Can that affect you, I guess, in, in the future? Or, like, will it follow you? Like, let's say probably, if you did say no. Probably so. That's why I'm saying it's probably a real gray area. So uh, it probably would follow you, so. Let's move on, shall we? Um, the next one, the next um, thing we'll talk about is excellence. Um, the PT practice will consistently use current knowledge and theory while understanding personal limits. So that means you're using current knowledge, so the most current and useful evidence in, in, out there and the most current theories out there and knowledge while understanding your own personal limits. So if you are if you have a patient that you're helping and they have needs that say maybe it's a specialization of therapy that you don't have, or they have a certain diagnosis that you don't have a lot of experience with, then you need to be able to understand your own limits and ask for help when that time comes. Now, it's always a good learning opportunity, but you need to ask for help so you can learn from the people that do have the experience so you can learn and so that your patient can get the right type of care and the best care. Um, you integrate your judgment and patient and the patient, you integrate your judgment with the patient's perspective in mind. Um, you embrace advancement in the field. So you're always looking for new and exciting ways to do things and looking for the most recent and scientific ways to do things and new ways. Um, Challenge mediocrity, so don't just do the same old things that have been done for the last 20 years. Um, and always work toward development of new knowledge. So you're always just, basically, this is lifelong knowledge, lifelong learning. Integrity, steadfast adherence to high ethical principles or professional standards, truthfulness and fair, fair, fairness. So just basically, you're always going to be abiding by the rules and the regulations of the profession. Um, trying to adhere yourself to the high standards of the ethics of our profession, being trustworthy and honest. And um, also, if, if you see harassment and bias in, among any other clinicians or any other coworkers, um, reporting that or trying to confronting those people to try to change their behaviors. So we have a duty of not only for to keep our own integ professional integrity, but in standards, but to try to maintain the integrity of, of our coworkers too. Our professional duty, the commitment to meeting to meetings one's obligations to provide effective PT services to patients to serve the profession and to positively influence the health of society. So that just facilitating each, each patient's achievements of goals, preserving the safety and security and confidentiality of patients. Might just get kicked out, sorry. Um, promoting our profession. So being a member of our, uh, being a member of the APTA and going to meetings and advocating for the profession and taking pride in your, in being a PTA. Um, you know, being a PT and a PTA, being an OT and a OTA, and being a, a speech thing, spare therapist. I mean, we're pretty special jobs. I mean, not we're pretty specialized in what the three of our jobs do. And we work, even though we have different goals we work on, really the three, our three professions really are really you can't really do one without the other. Like you can't have PT without OT. You can't have OT without speech and you can't have speech without OT. I mean, they, everything goes hand in hand when you're dealing with people. So, um, and in rehab, so you got to take pride in yourself and what you know, but also take pride in yourself and how you can help other clinicians and other disciplines um, 
you know, learn things from you and you can learn things from them. And then you all learn from each other and you all grow in your knowledge and help the patients better. Social responsibility, the promotion of mutual trust between the profession and the larger public that necessitates responding to societal needs for health and wellness. Um, so this just goes back to what I was talking about um, on the last couple of slides, advocating for the health and wellness um, needs of society. So just advocating for our profession um, in society, you know, um, advocating the need for PT and our, the, how we can help society, not just people with injuries and people that are sick, but how our knowledge as therapists and healthcare professionals, we can help people with just overall health and wellness too. So there's the physical therapists and PTAs that work in, in gyms and health clubs and spas too. And they, they do, maybe they see people and they do see people with injuries and needs, but they see them after they see them and get them better, they continue seeing them for training and for wellness and just overall maintain, maintenance and things like that. So they can do, you can do things like that in fitness centers and things like that. Um, participating in collaborative relationships with other healthcare professions um, professionals at the public at, and in public and at large. So that's co-treating with OT on a patient or um, participating in seminars, going to CEU events with other clinicians and other um, types of clinicians and learning about each other, learning how to treat together. Okay. These are some of the ethical documents that we have, and you can look these up on your own. I think these are links, and if the links don't work, all of these are available on the APTA website, but I think these links do take you straight to the APTA website. And that would be all. So, lots of information today. Um, Anybody have any questions with anything we went over today? Lots of ethical standards, guide to conduct, things like that. Nothing probably that is new or that probably that you, that I had to, anything that you didn't already know, but things that are, they're worth explaining and knowing, you know, we got to have them in writing somewhere for our profession. We got to have a guide somewhere to, to know how to act, so. The, I guess the basic moral, if you didn't listen to anything today in the lesson, if I was that boring, treat your patients the way you want to be treated and treat them with respect. Treat them with the, the way you would treat your own parents or grandmother, you know. Um, you know, if you, if, they're, if you have a bias against something about them, throw it out the door. Don't count, you can't hold anything against another person just because you believe differently and treat everybody exactly the way you want to be treated and do your very best in every session you know but also know your limits if you are doing your best and you feel like you need a little bit of help ask your neighbor on the next mat they might be working with their patient but say hey do you have an idea how another idea how i can work on this or hey i've seen you working with so and so on this with this type of exercise before, do you think this would work with my patient? Or can you help me for a second? I wanna, I've seen you doing this with a patient before. I wanna learn to do it like you do it so I can do it. Those types of things. We're always trying to better ourselves. Okay, that's all it is. It was all today was about. So um, any, I'm gonna stop the 